So I have the great honor and pleasure to introduce Edge to you. And uh, Edge was basically what we, from the cultural side, were already always waiting for in, in, on the internet. It was basically an intellectual salon. And then uh, what happened was, what we also was hoping for, the intellectual salon became a network of thought, a global network of thought. And in about uh, two minutes, you're going to see the core group of Edge, uh, which is going to be led by John Brockman. John Brockman started the site in uh, 1997 and was a digital outpost of a real salon, which is the, was the Reality Club. And the Reality Club was the first melding of the so-called third culture, where basically science, culture, and the humanities melded into one new stream of intellectualism, which is basically just starting to get its major thrust. And Edge is still a major force of this thrust. Um, well, it's always great to rave about John, but we let uh, Dennis Dutton do it. Dennis Dutton was another editor of uh, Intellectual Outposts on the web at the Arts and Letter Daily, if you know that. And the late Dennis Dutton, who recently passed away, said to John, he wrote in one of his last emails to John, you are the greatest intellectual impresario in the publishing in the world. In fact, there's not even any magazine editor who can compare with you in the current generation. So. You might want to just delve into the site edge.org later on to grasp how wide the range of topics and how wide the types of writers are there. Um, every year, and it's just out now, which is a great feature, John asks one deceivingly simple question. For example, like, what are you optimistic about? And uh, because there's this network of thousands of uh, really brilliant minds, the answers are mind-boggling. So this year's question was, um, what scientific concept would improve everybody's cognitive toolkit? So worth checking out. And uh, as I said, it's really wild. Um, there's also, he has a, a great device called the book. Um, so the question comes out every year. Um, the question from last year comes out as a book. And um, I talked to Martin Rowan last night, who's the editor-in-chief of Wired magazine. And uh, he's in this year's questions. I was in this year's and last year's. I'm, I'm in this book. I like, feel like a teenager. Um, he said, like, yeah, this is what makes you feel being an intern again, if you're asked to um, answer the edge question of the year. So I wish I could tell you this is a really historic meeting now because you're going to have the four core people of Edge here on stage. It isn't because they've known each other for quite a while. This whole uh, development actually started in 1965 when a composer named John Cage gave a copy of um, Norbert Wiener's Cybernetics to John. And John and Stuart Brand ended up um, underlining Norbert Wiener's Cybernetics um, page by page in a frantic reading session of uh, two days. So this is where it started, and I welcome you to s hear and see where it is now. Take it away. Stuart should be here. You're, you're supposed to be here. All of you are here because of something Stuart Brand said in a very offhanded way as a remark to Steve Wozniak. This was in Marin County at an old army base by the sea. We were having the first hackers conference. Uh, Stuart organized it with Kevin Kelly's help, a co-organizer, uh, got me to pay for half of it. and. Uh, all the original hackers were there, and uh, uh, I forget what Wozniak said, but Stewart said the following. I was there, right next to him. On the one hand, information wants to be expensive because it's so valuable. The right information in the right place just changes your life. On the other hand, information wants to be free because the cost of getting it out is lower and lower all the time. So you have these two things fighting against each other. Uh, that remark was picked up by Kevin Kelly in the Coevolution Quarterly, in, which he published in 1985. And somehow, all of you forgot half of it. Uh, and information wants to be free became a, a mantra. It became 
uh, in, art, in ideology. It, it, for some, it's a religion. For others, it's a, it's a cash box for stock or speaker fees. But uh, I've always been wondering about the tension of the two fighting against each other and what happened to one half of the fight. And so all of you know enough about Stuart. I will just ask him to get on. He's not even going to talk about this. Um, he is the author of, and I have the books somewhere. May I? The recently published Whole Earth Discipline, Why Dense Cities, Nuclear Power, Transgenic Crops, Restored Wildlands, and Geoengineering are Necessary. Um, what we do uh, at these EDGE meetings is uh, it's always based on the interrogative, and we ask people to ask each other the questions they're asking themselves. So he's not here to talk about his book, which he was questioning himself about four years ago. Uh, he's on to new things, and I will ask him to pick it up. Stuart Brand. It's, uh, do we got slides? I'm an environmentalist. I've been an environmentalist since I was 10. Uh, that was 60 years ago. And it's tough being an environmentalist now. Because um, things have switched around. How are we for sound? Are we good? This, this is what's happening. With climate change, we're looking at the situation where us environmentalists, instead of protecting natural systems from civilization, we're now trying to protect civilization from a natural system, which is climate uh, responding to our apparently excess uh, greenhouse gases. And if they go ahead as we are today, then we won't get a stable climate until maybe five degrees Celsius warmer, which is exactly what it was 55 million years ago in the Eocene, Paleocene uh, thermal maximum. There's no rainforests in that world. Uh, there's carrying capacity for maybe one and a half billion of us in that world. And we would be tough getting from the seven billion we have now to the one and a half billion. So what we want is somehow to keep the civilization friendly climate we've had for the last 10,000 years going for another 10,000 years. That would be nice. And then we get to keep having a civilization. So in light of that, some different things are green than they used to be back when the modern environmental movement took shape in the 1970s. Some of our ideas and methods from them don't really apply now. We used to hate cities, but we're now realizing that cities are green. And they're green for one of the reasons that we uh, got worried about early on was the whole question of what happens with human population increasing. Well, the thing that happened with cities is, as we are urbanizing now, which everybody is very rapidly, is the rural populations are dropping off, and we are also going to get to the place where the city populations also level off and drop. So we'll get to a point where a population will basically get to eight or nine billion, level off, and then head downward precipitously by the second half of this century. The reason is that cities are population sinks. And as we get to 80% of the population of the world living in cities, we get into this negative, uh, below carrying, the below level keeping birth rate, and then carry right on down. Kevin Kelly is pretty persuaded that uh, by the second half of the century, we will have a population crisis, but it'll be like the one that is in Japan and Russia, some on it in Germany, of not enough children happening. So what's really going on is the big event, and Jeffrey West has been tracking on this, is that with 1.3 million new people in cities every week, 70 million a year, that goes on decade after decade. It is changing the world demographically and economically. Because the, the villages of the world are emptying out. That's good news ecologically because then the natural systems there grow back very rapidly, especially in the tropics. Where people are going is where the action is. Mostly squatter cities, slums. A billion people in slums now. Another billion are expected in the next few decades. And instead of being squashed by poverty, in these places, people are busy as hell getting out of poverty just as fast as they can. 
They are basically entrepreneurs. They uh, create jobs if they don't exist. They operate in the informal economy, and they create their own homes, their own towns, their own economies, bit by bit. And that's where all the adaptation is in the world today. Demographers are saying, city planners are saying that basically squatters are the major builders of cities in the world these days. That's economic good news for the people there. They are getting out of poverty gradually. They're bringing their countries out of poverty, as in India. And they are moving toward the energy patterns of developed cities that we have here. So places like uh, Dharabi here in Mumbai, soon enough, are going to look like downtown London. Everybody in the global south is tired of being sweaty all the time. They are going to get air conditioners. So they need grid electricity, baseload electricity, electricity that is always on. Cities are 24-7. If you're going to light up at night and keep warm in the winter like here and cool in the summer, you're going to need a lot of electricity. So far, the only clean forms of electricity come from hydro and nuclear that feed into baseload. Because as yet, we don't have storage for wind and solar, and you're starting to see green-on-green -green fights between environmentalists over things like wind. We're saying it's all very well uh, to get that nice, clean energy, and it is, but it uses up a lot of terrain, basically 250 square miles for one gigawatt of electricity. And here in Europe, you're starting to get experience with wind and realize that it takes a lot of subsidies to keep it going. So you're starting to see political cartoons like this from Britain. Same thing with solar. In California, a whole lot of people want to put a lot of solar, quite rightly, in the Mojave Desert. Well, the Mojave Desert is a green desert. And uh, when you bulldoze it for solar farms, uh, it gets pretty rough. So Bill Gates makes a nice distinction between energy farms using very dilute sources of energy like wind, biofuels, and solar, and energy factories that are very concentrated like coal, gas, and nuclear. To a certain extent, those concentrated factories are greener than the things that are big and wide and using up too much space. So I had to change my mind about nuclear and by climate uh, forcing me to rethink uh, what's really green in terms of greenhouse gases. And the thing that an environmentalist wants to do is compare the waste streams. So the waste stream of, what do you got? Coal are doing 40% of the world's electricity, nuclear about 16%. But look at what happens with the coal waste and the electri electrical waste from nuclear. If all of your electricity came from nuclear, it would be about one Coke can's worth of waste. But one gigawatt a day from a coal-fired plant is turning 8,000 tons of fuel into 19,000 tons of carbon dioxide, plus all the slurry and mercury and all the rest of it. And so that's why you get to uh, a situation where basically the waste compared to nuclear, where you've got 20 tons of fuel in a gigawatt year turning into 20 tons of waste, which is easy to store, you have 2.9 million tons of coal converting into 8 million tons of carbon dioxide a year. And where that goes is into everybody's atmosphere and spent into nice dry cash storage where you can keep an eye on it. So the lifetime emissions of a kilowatt hour for these various energy sources, nuclear is down there with hydro and wind and ahead of solar. Environmentalists are always worried about nuclear waste. How are we going to bury it? Well, as it happens in the United States, We've been keeping it like you probably do here in dry cash storage out back of the parking lot. It's okay there. Uh, we also have been putting it for 10 years now into a thing called the WIP, the isola uh, Waste Isolation Violet Plant in New Mexico, down half a mile in a salt formation. And that salt formation is 250 miles in uh, circumference. It has been there for 250 million years. It's not going anywhere. Water doesn't get in or out of it. It doesn't matter what you put the waste in, the salt heals in around it and encases it. So the nuclear waste problem that I thought was insoluble has actually been solved long ago. It's not a major issue. From the technology standpoint, which this group should be interested in, the usual reactor these days, like from Areva or Westinghouse, is 1.6 gigawatts. But there are starting to be these small modular reactors 
that are down around 25 gigawatt, megawatts, and a fraction of that. They are built in factories instead of on site. They're inexpensive. You stick them in the ground, and that's the containment vessel. And they're being built rapidly. The Russians already have some barge-based ones they're going to use up along the uh, northern sea route where the ice is melting. Uh, there's an outfit in New Mexico called Hyperion that has uh, developed uh, uh, Jeff, this came out of Los Alamos Labs, their design. And then uh, Oregon has one called New Scale. These things are all modulars. The idea is you can get one, uh, run part of the electricity with it in your town, build on another, another, and another. They're pretty much plug and play. Uh, the makers of uh, all of the nuclear reactors the Navy uses in the US, Babcock and Wilcox, has one they've just come out with that's starting to be uh, ordered in the United States, the Tennessee Valley Authority. There's even a small fourth generation reactor, an integral fast reactor that not only burns nuclear waste, but these things run hot enough to desalinate water and generate hydrogen. Uh, there's various thorium reactor designs coming along. India is very interested in that because they have a lot of thorium. Uh, this design uh, from Intellectual Ventures is meant to be put in place, run for 60 years, and then just left there. It is its own burial vault. Bill Gates has come out very strongly for nuclear, and as he's helping support design uh, experiments with a new complete approach called uh, wave reactor. It's nice to have some new ones coming along. We've always said that fusion would be swell, but it's a long time in the future. Uh, but actually, I discovered that at the Lawrence Livermore Lab in California, they're a few months away from getting ignition of a laser inertial fusion Ignition, if they get that, then they're maybe 10 years away from an actual one gigawatt laser inertial fusion engine. That would change everything because <laughs> I think environmentalists will step right up to this one because you're looking at zero greenhouse gases, zero mining, zero waste stream, zero possibility of meltdown, and no possibility if it could be used for weapons. So the issue with nuclear, it's kind of expensive. The solar, solar and wind and all these other things. The problem is that coal is expensive. And this is where governments come in. Basically, the governments of Europe, North America, China, and India have to find a way to make coal expensive. And if they do that, then we have a shot. And if they don't, we're in very deep trouble. I especially am interested to say in Europe that GM is green, genetically modified crops. Turned out to be green. They didn't really get designed for that. but. Uh, among the people who picked up on them, and Kevin Kelly reported this, is the Amish, the most technologically conservative farmers group in America, love this because, as many farmers have found, they are better seeds. And so they use BT corn, and so does South Africa, where uh, it's used for the very popular white maize. This is the most successful innovation in agricultural history, and uh, it's taking off all over the world except a few left behind places. I think environmentalists, for wrong reasons, took a stance against genetic engineering at the beginning. Uh, these things turn out to be green by accident instead of by design. They can be a lot greener than they have, but we have stood in the way of golden rice in uh, Asia, and we have stood in the way of Africa moving ahead with much better tropical crops designed and uh, made by engineering. So the moral issue, according to the Newfield Council on Bioethics, is that there is a moral obligation to make GM technology available to everybody, especially in the developing world, that wants it. One of the reasons is that we first had things that are good for farmers. Now we're getting things coming that are good for consumers, for the people who eat these engineered foods. So cassava, which is a staple for 800 million people, is actually a dreadful food. All it is is starch. But there's a version of it coming along that has everything you would want in it, including less cyanide, which is one of the aspects of that food. Uh, the things I've marked with a red dot here are all foods that we're going to want, such as peanuts that are not allergy-causing, soy that would not be allergy-causing, soy that has omega-3 fatty acids. That's already coming, and so it goes. Basically, we're moving from the rather slow pace of recombinant DNA to a much more rapid pace now, what's called uh, Synthetic biology uh, is coming directly to children, much as computers have done. 
And you're seeing uh, every year now the IGM meeting in Massachusetts, uh, hackers are, these biotech hackers are getting together from 26 countries to uh, race their hot rotted microbes. So now we get to geoengineering. Geoengineering, at least the research is green. We don't know if we need it, but what we're realizing is that there's the artificial infrastructure of bridges and things like that, but the river under the bridge is infrastructure too. The artificial infrastructure is based on the natural infrastructure, the forest, and especially the atmosphere and the climate that goes with it. So to keep this climate something stable like we recognize, now that we know there's lots of instabilities in this highly nonlinear complex system, we are stepping up to the realizations that a lot of things are going to frighten us into, in the next decade, uh, taking geoengineering seriously. We need to do the research now, and that's what we're moving up on, because we realize that it can be very cheap. Uh, it was free in 1991 when Mount Pinatubo blew and cooled the whole planet off by half a degree Celsius. Uh, here's a version of doing an artificial a uh, volcano every year from the group in Seattle. And for a couple of hundred thousand a year, uh, putting up sulfur dioxide in the stratosphere at a rather small quantity can keep the planet cooler by three degrees Celsius as we increase things. So we are now in an era called the Anthropocene, an era in which humans are running way too much of the atmosphere and everything else badly. We're in a situation where we don't have a choice of stopping terraforming. We only have a choice of terraforming well. And that's the green project for this century. Thank you. Thanks. Forty-five years, for my money, the most influential thinker in America. Next. Kevin Kelly is the big ideas guy at Wired. He was the founding editor of Wired in 1993. Uh, he's still connected to the magazine as their advisor. And uh, in terms of running edge, when we do the annual question, we start in August and start emailing each other. And it goes on and on and on. And typically, it's Kevin that comes up and cuts through the crap and has the big idea. And uh, he's always exciting. Kevin Kelly. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? You know, um, <clears throat> the uh, world before Darwin was very curious because um, that was the theory of biology. It was just a collection of things. There was really no other organizing framework. It was just um, one thing after another. And actually today, although we're all involved in making stuff, we don't actually have a very good theory of technology. It's, it's just basically one thing after another, just like it was before Darwin. And I want to offer today a suggestion about a theory for technology, some framework that we could put into that we can understand what it means for us. And I want to start with the fact that we actually don't even know what technology is. Now, here's a common definition of technology. It was anything that was invented after you were born. Or else, it's this one. It's anything that doesn't work yet. But actually, it has to be more than those things, of course. It's, it's everything in this room. It's the carpeting. It's the structures. It's the conduit. But more importantly, of course, it's the intangibles like calendars and other uh, uh, laws software. But I actually think it's even more critical than that, which is that um, if you take these two uh, technological objects, the one on the left was something that you, anybody here could probably make. The one on the right is one that none of us here can make. In fact, all of us here together probably couldn't make it. But that's because the one on the right is actually composed of hundreds, if not uh, thousands of sub-technologies. It actually, um, and those sub-technologies require other technologies below to compose it and to make it work. So actually, you might want to think of this object as more like a network. And as Jeffrey West shows, networks are what really make up everything that we make. And if we look at networks, we can actually understand that, in fact, this technology, the one that in my clicker, the one that's running the computers here, that these technologies actually form one large network one, maybe one ecosystem of technology, or maybe even a superorganism of technology. And I'm interested in that superorganism. I give it a name called the technium to, dis to, to indicate that it's more than just culture, that in fact it is something that has its own 
agenda, something that has its own response, its own agency. And I, and I use the word want, I talk about what technology wants, to indicate that it is, has a leaning, a, a kind of a general urgency. And I use the word want provocatively. This is a computer from Willow Garage. It's been programmed to find its own power by roaming through the hallways looking for an outlet. And it takes its tail with this nine eyes, and it plugs itself in to recharge. I stood between it and an outlet, and I could feel that it wanted electricity. It was not conscious. It was not deliberate. There was an agency from that system. And I use the same word to talk about what technology wants, what the system of the technium wants. And I use the word want to mean the way in which a plant wants light, or a bacterium wants food. It's not intellectual. It's not conscious. It's a general trend in that direction. So the good news is that the, the, there's good news and bad news. The bad news is that this technology wants something of its own agenda. It's selfish. That's the bad news. The good news is that this technology has a moral dimension. It wants good stuff for us, OK? That there, that there is a general, long-term, positive force for good by technology. And so I wanted to quickly give you a sense of where and how we can understand that. So I suggest that the way we ask what technology wants is by asking a, a different question, and that's based on the fact that there was an amazing discovery 50 years ago that the essence of life was not energy and was not carbon, but in fact it was information. And of course, that's the essence of technology. And so there's actually a kind of equivalency between the world of the born and the world of the made. The stuff that is living and the stuff that's made is actually not as far apart as we thought. That actually we can import biological evolution into computers, and of course we can engineer life. And so there's, they're a lot closer than we think. And that gives us permission to actually look at evolution in life for suggestions about understanding technology. And so I ask myself, what does evolution want? What are the long-term trends, the long-term agencies in the evolutionary system? And I think the one we can actually understand and see easiest easiest is the idea that there's increasing diversity over time in life over 3.7 billion years. That's obvious to us, and actually you can see that in the data. But there's also another long-term trend, which is this movement towards complexity. Things start off simple, and they go to, to the complex. That is a long-term trend. It's not just an apparent thing. It's not just a projection. We actually can show that there is a slight drift toward things becoming more complex. Very, it's very, very rare when complex things actually become simple. So we intuitively feel that there's a long journey towards the more complex. But I want to indicate that that's not suggesting that there's a ladder of evolution, that we're kind of climbing up. I'm suggesting, that in fact, that it's a radiation outward. Every organism on Earth today is equally evolved. There is an outward radiation. There is a direction, not a destiny. So the other things that evolution is moving towards is not just greater complexity and diversity, but also specialization. There's increased mutualism. 50% of the species on Earth are either parasitic or symbiotic. There is an increased direction towards um, sentience. Evolution again and again invents brains and minds. There is a movement towards evolvability. The entire process of evolution itself is evolving. The process by which things change are changing. So those are the some of the general trends in evolution over time. And so we see the same thing happening in the technium. You can kind of see the diversity of the made world. These are spark catchers from 100 years ago. And they have the same kind of variety that, say, butterflies or beetles would have. That's, in, that's one of the directions that technology is going. You see increased specialization. So the first camera is a general purpose camera or hammer. But over time, we make more specialized versions. We make a panoramic camera, an underwater camera. Then we make more specialized versions of those. You make the panoramic underwater camera. And then we make the panoramic underwater infrared camera. We keep making more specialized versions. We see the same thing in, in the same way that, in fact, we can almost map out the technological evolution almost as if it was a tree of life. Okay? And so the similarities are so great between the way that technological system evolves and the way the life evolves that I actually suggest that we should think of the technium 
as an extension of the six kingdoms of life, those are the six kingdoms, plants, fungi, animal, and three varieties of bacteria, that we should imagine that the technium is actually the seventh kingdom of life. It's actually been extended outward from the primates, and it behaves almost the same way. And so we can ask ourselves, well, what does the technium, the seventh kingdom of life, want? And I think the answer to a first approximation is that it's going in the same very general trends, the same general tendencies as evolution. So what technology wants is what life wants, basically, to, to a rough degree. So what does that mean? Well, there is, it means for us the fact that every new invention that we, that we invent also brings us new problems, maybe almost as many problems as we have solutions. And at first, that would suggest a couple of things. One is that most of the problems in the world today are technogenic. I would suggest that most of the problems in the world today are also going to be caused by technologies that we have invented today. And at first, that might suggest that there is just a 50-50 wash, that in fact, maybe technology is just neutral, but I actually think there's something else going on. It's not the full story. The full story is that when we invented that first hammer, we actually created a choice to use it for ill or for good that we didn't have before. We could use the hammer to kill someone or build a house. But that choice, which did not exist before, is, it, is, is itself good, even if we use something for bad. So having the choice itself is a positive good. That positive good tight, it tilts the balance slightly in favor of the good, even by a little tiny bit. But it turns out a little bit is all we need. Because even if we use technology to, dis to create only 1% more than we destroy a year, that 1% delta, that tiny little delta, is all we need compounded over centuries to make civilization. So in fact, a tiny incremental delta created by the fact that we're creating new choices with everything that we invent, including the choice to use it for harm. So that is what we get. That's what gives the long-term moral dimension to technology. Because if we have a bad idea, nobody, if I had a bad idea, nobody here is going to suggest that I think less, or did I stop thinking? The proper response to a bad idea is a better idea. Likewise, the proper response to bad technology is not less technology, it's not no technology, it's better technology. It's a technocentric view. So we always are increasing the options, and even when we have problems with the things that we've invented, it's not to have less, it's actually have to more and better including the problem that technology at times can be environmentally harmful. The proper response for that is not less technology. It's actually better technology, greener technology. And so far we've seen, to our best of our knowledge, we've not invented a technology that we could not invent an even, green, even greener version of. And so that means that in a certain sense, the tech team is not inherently anti-life. If it is the seventh kingdom of life, it is inherently compatible with life. We've always been able to make things greener. So what that means, I think, is that we're involved in trying to relocate technologies. We, make it, we want to make a convivial form of them to find the right job for them. So DDT was an invention, a molecule that we used, and we sprayed it in millions of pounds on millions of acres of agricultural as, a, as a, a pesticide. And that was a total environmental disaster. The same invention, the same molecule, relocated and sprayed judiciously around households in the tropics is the best eradicator of malaria, saving hundreds of millions of lives a year. We relocated that technology. Rather than ban it, say less technology, we said, no, let's have a better idea. So what does technology want? I think it really wants one thing. We could collapse that long list of things that evolution wants and say that what technology really wants is increasing differences, diversity, options, choices, opportunities, possibilities, freedoms. That's what we get from technology. That's what it is bringing to us, everything that we invent. So that while we are sitting here and at home or at work making new stuff, making new things, that sometimes we feel, well, we're just kind of feeding the consumerist machine, the capitalist machine that's driving all this stuff that we consume, and maybe it's ephemeral, and we don't use it very long, we throw it out, and maybe at times we're seized with doubt about whether this is worthwhile. It may be that we're not doing anything more than that at times, but in fact, I think we are. 
when we make new technology, we're actually increasing the possibilities and choices and differences in the world. And the reason why that is good is because most of us need some kind of tool to help us find and express our genius. So Mozart needed the technologies of the piano and the harpsichord to actually find and develop his genius, or that could have been Beethoven or anyone else. But imagine if Mozart had been born 2,000 years before the invention of the piano or the symphony. What a loss to us and to him that would have been. Or imagine if Van Gogh had been born 2,000 years before we had invented oil paints and canvas. What a loss to the world and to him that lack of technology would have been. Or, you know, what if we had not invented the technologies of cinema before, say, Hitchcock or Lucas had been born? What a hole in our culture that would have been. That means that today, somewhere in the world, there is a boy or girl born, some Shakespeare of their generation, who is waiting for us to invent their technology so that they can share their genius. So we have an obligation to actually increase the amount of technologies in the world. We, just as we have benefited from those in the past who have invented stuff for us. And so what we want to do is to increase those possibilities in the world, but more importantly, it actually connects us to something even longer, which is that there is a long-term trend in the universe of increasing self-organization, which began at the Big Bang, and self-organized galaxies, which self-organized stars, which are furnaces to self-organize heavier metals out of lighter atoms. And those heavier metals and atoms would self-organize into a planet and maybe an atmosphere. And those, at least on our planet, self-organize into life, which self-organize into the mind and the technium. So there is actually kind of a long-term trend, even beginning at the Big Bang, of increasing diversity, specialization, complexity, that life is just extending. In fact, the cosmos the bios and the technos are just one long string of this story. And the te technium is sort of the most recent incarnation and the acceleration of that long-term trend that runs through the universe. So that when we make things, when we have a technological diversity and when we make increased technology, we're actually participating in something that goes even way before us and of course will run through and beyond us. And so we actually are involved in much more than just sort of inventing novelty. We're actually involved in, the, in kind of a, a larger thing that's bigger than ourselves that can bring meaning to our lives. We're involved in actually increasing the possibilities, both for us, our children, and for the world at large. And I think that is actually what technology wants. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Kevin. I uh, uh, just want to add that Kevin is the author of two fabulous books, Out of Control and New Rules for New Economy, and the recently published What Technology Wants. Also, it's interesting that he has no college or university degrees. George, I don't believe, went to college. I made the waiting list at a college. Uh, Stuart's the educated person here. But it, it's interesting in terms of concerns about what's happening in America with the educational system. Uh, David Galunter is here, the great computer scientist, and talks about how science gets pushed out of the universities. Um, but I don't even know if the universities are the place where it happens. It's interesting. Uh, our last speaker, and we, we have a time issue, is George Dyson, uh, author of Darwin Among the Machines, Project Orion, a science historian among futurists. I met him when he lived 40 feet high in a redwood tree. Uh, he's come down, uh, which is good for us. He spent the last seven years on a book entitled Turing's Cathedral, which is the name he came up with for the Google campus. Uh, he's worked for seven years on what I consider the creation myth of the digital realm, starting with John von Neumann in Hungary and leading to his talk at Mountain View uh, on the 60th anniversary of von Neumann's famous paper. George Dyson, uh, sister, brother of Esther, son of Freeman, and the smart one of the family.
Thank you very much. It's, it's great to be here, and I thank the, the Berta family and, and Steffi and John Brockman for, for me being here. And I thank my sister Esther, who used to do a conference like this, for, for introducing me to Brockman. But we, and I, I, I didn't bring slides, but I brought a, a couple props. So we're, we're really all here because of Stuart Brand. And, and this was his, uh, was a 1972 Rolling Stone article turned into a book. And the title was Fanatic Life and Symbolic Death Among the Computer Bums. And, and here we are, we're still here. He's still, Stuart's still hanging out among the computer bums. But, but Stuart really helped make this industry, which was not an industry then, it was, it was a hobby. He, he brought it to Rolling Stone and made it, made it fashionable. In a way, that was a very important moment. And I urge anyone to, to reread this. He, he sort of got all the things we're still working on today were part of that uh, original story. So he, he went and visited people who were setting up the first 20 nodes of the ARPANET, were already using it for games. He talked to the people trying to build something called the Dynabook, which was a laptop, you know, way too ahead of its time. So and I'm a historian, and in the history of computing, there's really, there's an Old Testament and there's a New Testament. And the, the Old Testament, the prophet really was, was Leibniz from, from here in Germany, who, who believed in this perfect definable digital universe in which everything could be defined with, with binary code and all truths would be discovered. And he went to the grave believing in that and it, it, it looked really good for a long time. So Leibniz sort of supplied the logic and then the New Testament was von Neumann who, who came and, and built the machines that made Leibniz's dream come to life. And in between the Old Testament and the New Testament, was Alan Turing in 1936. So what the moment I'm going to go back to is, is exactly 60 years ago. It was, it was 1946 that this group of Neumann started to try and build a computer, the, the, the machine that became this entire world we live in. And in 1951, they finally got the thing running. So from 1946 to 1951, that those five years, they were working on this, this thing. And I was last here at DLD in 2006, and now it's 2011. So it's exactly the same span of time. But those guys, against all odds, it was only a group of about six people, they conceived and developed the, the technology and built this machine, got it running and debugged and actually solving serious problems. And in, in this whole similar amount of time, I've just been writing about it. So, so it's very humiliating how, how much they got done. So 1951, they finally get the machine running. This is my other prop. And this is an actual image of the digital universe at that, when, when it came to its birth in 1951. In the real universe, we can only imagine, but here we can actually see it. It's a 32 by 32 bit array of charged spots that can be accessed by the control organ of the machine in, in 24 microseconds, you can go to any spot. And they had 40 of these tubes. These were on the face of a cathode ray tube, which now people don't know what a cathode ray tube is, the, the new generation. But it's a glass tube, and like this bottle, about the same size but much thinner. And inside is a vacuum. There's nothing in there but electrons. And in this end is an electron gun that is producing a stream of electrons. And there's two coils that can aim the beam on an X and a Y axis. So on the, on the face, the, so what happened at that moment in time in 1951, this was an, an analog device. If you doubled the voltage, you doubled the deflection, and you could add numbers by, by adding and subtracting voltages in an analog way. They 
by putting this matrix, making it into a 32 by 32 bit matrix, they made the first digital. So this, the big switch from analog to digital was at that moment. And then, of course, that was the origins of software, because they started writing codes that, that would use this memory. So we switched from having numbers that represented things and meant things from for the first time to codes that were numbers that could do things. And that was the profound, uh, really, the sort of moment that we're all still in, in the repercussions of. That if you took, uh, it took five bits to specify a position on this axis and five bits on that axis, that, gave, that was 10 bits, you would go to one of these locations where 40 of these tubes, you, you put in 10 bits, you got 40 bits out. That, that was a chain reaction, just like the nuclear weapons they were trying to design. So we went from analog to digital. They used that machine to I have here a list of the problems that they, they worked on. They worked on, here I've put an axis in time, and here are five different problems they worked on. They worked on nuclear explosions, which were on a time scale of, of 10 to the minus 8 seconds. They worked on shock waves, which were over, over you know, fractions of seconds to seconds. And they worked on meteorology, which was in the middle, was sort of minutes to months to years. And they also worked on biological evolution over, over hundreds and thousands of years. And then stellar evolution, which is the evolution of, of stars and solar systems up, up to 10 to the 17th seconds. So a time scale of, of 25 orders of magnitude. And we happened, what's interesting is that if you, if you look at what's the exact middle the exact middle of that whole, t whole time scale is two hours, which is about the length of a Hollywood film. That somehow we, our perceivable universe, sort of the time we can take to tell a story is right in the middle of, of it. And I, that may just be an accident, or it may be, I think, have something to do with what Kevin is talking about, how we really are a product of this entire universe. So that's how we got here. Then. From that perspective, where are we going next? Where is this whole digital world going? And I'm going to completely uh, you know, risk being thrown out of here by saying that, that not that digital is over, but that we're going, we've already gone into a new phase that, that people just are not recognizing yet, that we're going back to analog. We're taking that cathode ray tube back the other way, and that if you look at what's really exciting people here most, it's the things like Facebook, Google, search engines, and so on. And an awful lot of what's being really done there is actually analog computing. That in the world of nature, in the world of brains, there's no digital code where a, a certain bit has a certain meaning. It's the computation is done in the analog way where frequencies uh, have meaning, and where things connect and topology has meaning. And if you look at a search engine, that's exactly what's happening. It's counting the pulse frequency of connections between topological points. If you look at what Facebook does, if you, if you took, say, a, a small high school and tried to write an algorithm that defined who was friends with whom, you would be completely lost very soon, because every day somebody breaks up and then somebody's friend is not somebody's friend. You could never keep track. And what, what Facebook does this for 600 million people. And they, do it, they did it by building an analog computer, by simply connecting, allowing all the people to connect with a very simple digital code. You don't, when you join Facebook, you download very little code. And then the whole system becomes its own analog computer that maps the, the changes in the connections. So pulse frequency coding template-based addressing, which is how molecular biology stores information, not, uh, you know, you get the next molecule by saying you want the next molecule that more or less matches this template. And that's how search engines work. You can get a match to a address without having to give a precise numerical address. So we saw in, in Juan's talk earlier how, you know, that, that Computers are, are now being used to program cells, and, and sort of my, my parting thought would be, I think it's also the other way, that life 
uh, cells have for billions of years been storing their genetic information outside the individual cell, sort of in the viral cloud. Why, why do we all get colds? I mean, if, if colds were, you know, were purely harmful, we would have stopped having colds millions of years ago. And we get colds because we need that input-output mechanism to get genetic sequences out of the viral cloud. That's an important interface. And I think in, in many ways, life is uh, using computers to, to sort of further the agenda of life as much as computers are using cells to, uh, to grow the technology. It's a symbiotic relationship. So uh, in a way, we're still living in the, in the world of, of Leibniz, but it's, it's, uh, it's definitely going somewhere else, and we're not, we're not going to have to. It, a lot happened in 1951. Uh, we went from zero kilobytes to the, mem the memory in this computer I talked about, they did all that with that. That memory was five kilobytes. You used to be able to say that was the memory of a desktop icon, but, but icons have, there's icon bloat. So now it's, it's the memory of your cursor is five kilobytes. And the, the year I was born, the total memory in the world was 53 kilobytes. So thank you to, to Stuart and everyone else. Here we are. Uh, do we have time for questions? Steffi, questions? This whole notion of, you know, sort of Indian, old Indian mystics would argue that this is what consciousness has always, you know, desired, which is that machines will, uh, will cooperate with, with the human mind and with the human, you know, soul, so to speak, to evolve in a symbiotic sort of a way so that we evolve as a species towards greater freedom, creativity, and, uh, and greater play. And that's what we are heading for. And I, you know, I'm beginning to sort of, in my, in my talk tomorrow, what I'm going to speak about is this whole idea that the old institutions that have limited the human, uh, you know, the human endeavor are slowly crumbling. And uh, I, I think these technologies that you've been talking about are playing a, a sort of a pivotal role in, um, in, in, in uh, ushering us towards an age of freedom and creativity. And technology is just an accomplice to this whole mission. But there's a whole mystical story to this, which is, you know, over 5,000 years old. And it is so beautifully documented in some of our Upanishads and so on. And I, I just wish Deepak was here to answer some of this, because it's just written almost in mathematical language. And I hope to share it with you informally in the next few days. Thank you.